Okay, let's continue where we left off earlier in part one. And before we continue though, if you haven't seen the first part of this video series yet, make sure you click on part number one because otherwise this whole um, series two part wouldn't make so much sense, right? Because we went through the first nine point already. So make sure you go back to that first before you continue here. And also, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to uh, studymyfaith.com. Go there, click on it, learn about it, or you can just subscribe here on YouTube. So let's go now into point number 10, right? Point number 10, the reference to the key word Kyrios, right? Kyrie, Lord. That word perhaps we're familiar with because we hear it in, you know, at the Mass, for example, Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleison. Now, this word is very interesting because it means Lord, it means God, but then it also means head of household in ancient classical Greek. So if we can take like the dual play of this word here, it gets very important. You see, at this point, Jesus tells the woman, go call your husband, right? And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right in saying you have no husband because you have five. And the person you're with right now is not your husband. Very interesting, right? The word kyrios refers also to husband or head of household. Now, if we replace that, for example, to the word Lord, think about it. Go call your Lord, right? Go call God. Oh, I don't have God. Um, I'm not religious, for example. Think about that, right? And Jesus says, no, well, wait, you have other gods, right? You have other idols, etc." So the word kyrios is very interesting here. And as we understand it, it means both Lord and head of household, right? So if you interchange that, you see what's going on, which gets me to point number 11, right? 11. Point number 11 is very interesting because it refers to false gods, false idols. Think about how many husbands this woman have. If we read on a surface level, we think, well, she's an adulterous woman. We get it. But it goes deeper. Think about how many gods she has, right? How many idols she has. Now with her though, what about us? How many gods do we have? We might say, for example, oh, I only have one God because I believe in God. But let me ask you this question. Do you only have one God? Or do you have other gods, like the God of money and wealth, the God of power, the God of fame, the God of prestige, etc.? Those are gods as well, right? And so St. John is inserting this point in here to really help this woman to purify herself, not only on a literal level saying, hey, you do have five husbands, literally, but then who is your God? Who is your Lord, so to speak, right? Very important here as we reflect on this very point. Now, to us modern re readers, sometimes we might get confused and we think of idols as in like statues. But it's not just statues. It's like, what is it that is first in our lives, in our priorities, right? Who really is our God, so to speak? And we have to be very honest with ourselves about it, right? Because if we think about the, the time, what time, what we spend most of our time with, that can tell us a lot about who our gods are, so to speak. Now, as we continue on the dialogue, I think this gets even more interesting because now this woman is beginning to continue this dialogue with Jesus. And, you know, point number 12 I want to make is, so oftentimes in our own lives, we say, oh, we can worship God anywhere, right? We can worship God in church, in our home, in the park, anywhere. Maybe that's our modern notion. But think about this. Go into this passage again and read it. This woman says, sir, I can see that you are a prophet. You recognize, you know, I have five husbands, etc., and the one i with is not. But then she also says, our ancestors worship on this mountain, this mountain she's referring to is Mount Gerizim. But then your people say you worship in Jerusalem, referring to Mount of Moria, right? So how does Jesus respond to her? Well, first, let's back up. For the Samaritans, the place of worship is Mount Gerizim. For the Jews, it's 
in Jerusalem. So already there's a distinction between two places of worship. But then Jesus says, no, you will worship the, worshiping the Father in spirit and truth. There will be coming this time. Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You'll be worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. And if we think about it really deeply, in spirit and in truth, we're worshiping the Father. That's so true. In Jesus Christ who died for us on Mount Calvary. Right? It goes much deeper still. But let's just leave point number 12 there. Right? Does the place of worship matter? No, we worship the Father. Okay, point number 13, the Messiah, the Christ is coming. The woman still doesn't understand what Jesus is saying, so she responds, I know that the Messiah is coming. He is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us everything. But then Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you, the one speaking with you right here. And what does Jesus tell her? This is the most important point. Number 14, the Christ, the Messiah is right in front of you. The whole time, she's not able to see that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. And then now it finally took to this point where she recognized, where Jesus tells her plainly, I am he, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah. I am the one speaking with you. At this point then, the woman finally understands who she's speaking to, not just this prophet, not just someone greater than Jacob, but this Messiah, she has encountered Christ and that has completely changed her life. And so then point number 15, you see the encounter with Christ gave her this change of heart. And I want us to focus on that point very, very clearly. You see, she encountered with Jesus this whole time, she didn't recognize him, but now she recognized Christ. Her encounter with Jesus Christ changed her completely. And so then pay attention to the next point. She leaves the water jar behind and goes into town to tell everybody about Jesus. John, the evangelist, is literally telling us she's leaving her past behind. Her past is symbolized in this water jar. She's been going to this well every day, drawing water, but this water doesn't satisfy. She's thirsty again. But then when she encountered the Christ, she left everything behind to go and to tell other people about Jesus. The water jardin symbolizes her past. She leaves everything behind because now she had this metanoia. She had this change of heart, so to speak. She is transformed. So she leaves everything behind and she goes and announces to everybody who Jesus is, the Christ, the Messiah. She says, come see a man who told me everything I have done. Could he possibly be the Christ? This woman now is going out evangelizing, so to speak. She uses herself, herself as witness testimony. And as we see in the Gospel of John, he says, many of the Samaritans of that town began to believe in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me everything I've done. When the Samaritans came to him, we see in the final point I want to make here, they encounter Jesus for themselves. You see, this, these people, they believe the woman, but then they also want to see Jesus for themselves, right? How else would they believe? How else would they grow? The people then went out literally and encountered the Christ themselves. Here's how John puts it. They invited him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more began to believe in him because of his word, and they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of your word, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Beautiful, beautiful gospel reading. You see, the the, the final line, go back to it, read it, is really, really important. It fits exactly the phrase, faith seeking understanding. Take a look at this woman who was living in sin, who encountered Jesus, who had a change of heart, who went and shared everybody as witness testimony and drew others to Christ. 
But I want to point out as well, the people believed faith, they had faith, faith, but then they're also seeking to understand. They're searching until finally they reach Jesus himself and then they believe from non-believer into believer. So now let's go back to the very beginning. Remember in part one, I asked you this key question. What's the name of the Samaritan woman? As we can see, she's nameless. Can this Samaritan woman symbolize somebody? Who is she? Is, it she, uh, is she you? Am I the Samaritan woman? Now, we might be thinking for a moment, well, we can't relate because it's a woman and I'm a man, for example, right? Or I can't relate because, you know, I, uh, I'm not Samaritan, I'm not uh, familiar with the culture, etc. But yes, you can relate. Because the Samaritan woman symbolizes all of us, all of us in search of Christ. And it's only in our encounter with Christ who gives us this living water which we so yearn for, that our lives become transformed. We change. And as we can see too, there is this process of transformation, this process of interiorizing from hearing, from listening to the voice of the Lord, to having this change of heart, to living it in our lives, and then finally to evangelize. So finally, I invite you then to visit studymyfaith.com to learn more or to subscribe to this YouTube channel. I post weekly and I share the faith. Let's learn together and together let us journey in faith.